Hello, this is National Chess Master R. Rats. I'm back with another installment of the Nimzovich Defense. This will be the third one following the promotion video, introduction video. And this game was played back in the years 1986 to 1988 in ICCF Master Class, uh, an international master in, in uh, ICCF terms, uh, V. Hibble. Uh, anyway, let's just have a look. And we know the defining moves of the Nimzovich. This comes out of the D4 lines. And this is another knight c3 line. And as I've said, knight c3 is, is a move the masters prefer. But you can see it at all levels. And if you're going to take up this opening, you definitely need uh, to be prepared for it. And eventually, I'll show you some other ideas that I've tried here. I've mentioned that black can actually get away with moves like e5. And we'll get into that later. But the main line that we're, we, we were talking about last time is, is when you take on, on e4. And as I've said, the best move for white to try for an advantage is, is d5, and then black plays knight e5. And once again, we reach a fork in the road. And in, in the last video I presented, uh, I showed a variation with white playing Reuben Fine's line with queen d4, followed by uh, knight g6, uh, queen a4 check, and queen b3, uh, and attempting to hold on to the gambit pawn with the better position and and find assist that is better for for white when actually it's it's better for black nobody has yet refuted it but black has to work for the for the advantage but the other critical move in this uh, position that needs to be looked at and discussed is bishop f4 and I have a number of game examples with this I'll get to them all in time just gonna only go one at a time here to keep these simple and the key move uh, in this position is just to come back with the knight and and tickle the bishop, make it make it back up one square. And I mentioned this in the introduction video. Uh, Black has two decisions here, um, and they have both have pluses and minuses. And and the two moves, if you recall, are f5 and a6. And I've played both. I've won with both, and I've lost with both. And I'll get them all down eventually, and as we get through this series, but. Uh, it's this this position was one where I experimented with a6 I think for the first time was the first time I played this line because this game started in 1986 as noted and again we reach a critical uh, critical phase of this opening uh, what's going to happen next okay uh, white has some interesting candidate moves h4 being one of them and black pretty much needs to play e5 and according to Meyer's book he wasn't all sh altogether sure it was holding up as well as he thought it would. There's still there was still some uncertainty to to Black's position after e5. And I th I think it's fine still, uh, but this opening is still being written and the last word isn't out yet. So we didn't get into the different tangents with uh, with this position because this didn't occur. Uh, the old move that Black used to play was h5 and. Uh, Myers lost confidence in that doing another game, and he, and his this is out of his last edition before he passed away. He just said he wasn't all sure about e5 and it needed testing, uh, h4 e5. But White plays the other main line here, bishop c4, and now let's just uh, stop for a moment and see where we're at. Uh, White has three minor pieces developed. Black has just one, and although the a light squared bishop of blacks can get out pretty freely and his king's knight can come out look at that black bishop on f8 it, it's kinda sad uh, I do find a way to get it developed but it takes some it takes some maneuvering here and you'll see that as as the game unfolds but let's just talk for a moment and and show uh, just how uncomfortable black is right now that doesn't mean he's bad or worse it just means he's uncomfortable and he's got to work to get out of this okay so let's Let's consider what Black needs to play. He needs to he needs to be able to play e5 at some point to get his position free, because that will allow the king's bishop to develop, uh, so that uh, the king's knight can then come out and Black can castle and and can continue on his merry way. But there's a, an immediate structural problem with doing this, and, and let me just show it show it to you. It, it, okay, White White will play uh, take take on e6 with en passant, and Black is going to have some difficulties in his pawn structure, and it's going to be very difficult for Black to uh, to win this game. Now he he could hold it on for a draw, but structurally, 
structurally he's worse. Now, one move that looks very risky is to play f5, trying to hang on to this pawn. Without any development, it, it just looks shaky. So uh, you could analyze it on your own. But but just to, to show what does white do, or black do here, uh, he could take on d1 with check, but that just develops the white rook. So let's try this. Uh, let's try this. Okay, uh, bishop takes e6. Now uh, white could trade queens here, and even though theoretically it develops the black rook, uh, white's going to get some structural advantages here, and he's going to regain his pawn. And I'll show you. Let, let's just go here now. If, if black wants to take with the king, uh, in order to hold on to c7, white's just going to castle with check. The king will park himself on c8, and then this this rook is out of play, and white will be taking on e6 at an appropriate time and giving black a pair of isolated pawns on the open file, which is the structural weakness that white uh, that black accepts. So, so assume you just take back with the rook, and then uh, white continues like, like he just did. And if anything, white can just gain his pawn back right now. And, uh, and that way, or he can play even probably a better move is just bishop takes c7. This pawn's weak. It's not going anywhere. What's what's black going to do? Uh, rook d7. Now, there's candidate moves all along that diagonal or just come all the way back to uh, g3. The idea of going to b6 or a5 is so that this knight can uh, come over here with this maneuver, knight g e2 and knight g3 to surround and win that pawn on e4. Uh, and so uh, look at look at the white pawn structure. It's perfect. Nothing's moved. Just as center pawns are exchanged, and the black pawn structure is just weak everywhere. The only solid uh, pawns are uh, g7 and h7 because they haven't moved yet. And uh, like I say, black isn't losing this yet, but he he he's going to struggle. And if you're playing for a win with black, uh, this isn't probably not the position you want to try to play for a win from. So I just wanted to show that. Now, it's it's worth analysis. Uh, if you feel that you can hold on for a draw with this position and, uh, and and you're happy with the draw, you know, you might want to try it if everything else fails. But you're you're going to run into bishop f uh, bishop c4 lines. I mean, there's just no way around it. It's going to happen. So instead, what I play is uh, is the uh, uh, standard book line knight f6 and there's still some divergencies here as to what could happen and uh, h4 can can come in at any moment and I, I, I really don't want to go into all the tangents I've got some game examples of just about all these because I've played it so often but uh, uh, white plays this logical move queen e2 now what does this do well it prepares black to, or white to castle long uh, it uh, puts some pressure on e4. Uh, white will take that at his leisure, and it's it's also interesting. Now, there's an untested line. I, I'm not sure if I tested it or not in another game. I didn't test it in this game, and, and okay, what I play is bishop f5. But one idea to save a tempo with this bishop because it, it does go to g4 later is to play b bishop g4 immediately, and then white will gambit his. Uh, go ahead and play the pure gambit and gambit that pawn with uh, with uh, f3 and black takes it and and black's up a pawn but he's lagging in development so again you know this is a variation that you're going to be behind in development in but it's solid and it gets white out of his his main play uh, white white should be comfortable here but if you know the methods to uh, to extra extricate yourself from this uh, position and get your guys out, it, it holds up pretty well. So I I chose to play bishop f5. That's that's the move I played. But there's nothing wrong with trying bishop g4 here. Okay, so white continued with his development, and now here comes the maneuver uh, meant to attempt to free the uh, uh, to free the black e pawn to advance, and it's queen c8. Now this does a lot of things. It gets the queen off of uh, off of that d file, so that when and if uh, black does push his e pawn, it's it's not going to be fall victim to a discovered attack by the rook on d1. Now in similar positions, in some positions, I've actually played queen d7. In some cases, it's good, and in some places places it's just totally bad, and I've messed my whole game up. But queen c8 is is safe and solid. Queen d7 is trying to sneak one by. 
and it, it's it's uh, full of danger so uh, if all else fails if you're not sure and you're doing this maneuver play it to play it to c8 and you won't run into any surprises okay so now it's uh, it's white's turn and h4 as I mentioned is is often a threat and it come uh, here it comes now what what's the threat well the threat is to push it to h5 and what does the knight on g6 do well it cries a lot <laughs> it absolutely cries so one similar maneuver I'm not going to analyze it out uh, it's something for you guys to test because this type of maneuver comes up in a lot of these uh, Nimzovich positions in the Bogol Yuba variation one idea is to play e5 here now it may not work in this position simply because of the c6 well actually it does the knight has e7 as a flight but the purpose of uh, of e5 is is that if h5 kicks the knight now has the f4 square so uh, I didn't play it but it, it's 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 a maneuver that's possible instead what I do is I I do the temple loss maneuver which basically forces white to gambit that pawn so I've lost a tempo doing this but at the same time, I've 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 covered uh, my little my the threat on uh, h5. He can't push. Uh, first, his queen's under attack, and second, when when uh, what happens happens, uh, he he won't be able to push. So he he goes ahead and and give, gives me the pawn. So uh, now my bishop's under attack. I've got to f find a square for it. But instead, I I have another little maneuver and and that is knight h5 so I'm happy if he takes my bishop I'll just take his knight or his, his bishop with on g3 so this little maneuver stops his h5 tricks although theoretically I could back the bishop up to uh, h5 it's something to analyze if you're studying this position but but you, you kinda don't want to do that because if you look it one of the ideas of having the queen on c8 is you're trying to, to, to get e6 in and, and putting the bishop on h5 uh, or it, yeah putting the bishop on h5 takes it off that diagonal and it's still not certain how black is going to, to develop his king side and the way the queen is situated it's going to have to lose and if black wants to try to castle the queen side the queen's going to have to lose another tempo maybe now is the time to uh, get the uh, queen to d7 and castle long but again uh, black's king bishop and king rook are out of play and, and he still has to work so expect to work with this this variation but the analysis for the most part's holding up okay and uh, by the way his h4 move according to my original score sheet I've got an n there I used to write in my old score sheets n being novelty in other words it was the first time that that uh, move and showed up in a game I mean maybe it had been played but not published so it's a novelty to me and, and that's going to happen a lot in the Nimzovich defense you're going to be, be playing a lot of novelties or your opponent will be playing a lot of novelties because these things get out of book real quick the the book just isn't all that deep on this We're, we are writing history now and that's to me is fun I had a comment on my my wall somebody said ah, the French defense is better and, <laughs> and that, that that's kind of rude I mean what are you going to back that up with? I mean, maybe you don't like the Nimzovich, maybe you like the French, and we got in this little exchange back and forth, and he finally admitted, well, he can't play the Nimzovich. Well, take your time, learn it. You'll you'll do fine with it. I'd, I would much rather play an opening that's exciting and fresh and interesting and open to adventure and glory. You know, let's just, let's explore, let's discover, let's conquer. I don't want to play some Grandmaster's game from the, uh, 50 years ago and try and find an improvement on move fo uh, 48 just in order to maybe have winning chances and I'm saying that not so sarcastically uh, uh, chess is getting played out that's why the Nimzovich is so good because you, you're on fresh chess and if you understand the ideas you don't need to know variations and black still has a lot of uh, possibilities here and and, and and just let's just take stock for a second even though um, black's not developed and he is getting his pieces out okay I've got my I got three miners out now and I'm not castled but the rest of my of my position is pretty intact uh, the only pawn I have moved is the pawn on a6 and look at white scheme he's got a couple of isolated pawns I, I'm a pawn ahead uh, how, how is white going to get at the black king 
if black can consolidate and go down to an ending, black's winning. And so uh, the white path to victory is certainly not clear. White is going to have to work. and It'll generally come down to who's the better player, as it always does. But if you understand the ideas and the themes, then you can beat better players with this opening simply because you understand the concepts. And that's kind of key. And, and black's up a pawn. You know, here, here we are with another knight c3 variation, and, and black has bagged a pawn and is trying to convert it. So instead, now what I do is I put, instead of putting the bishop on h5, I put the knight on h5. That has immediate tempo, as I mentioned, on the, on the bishop, and he's got to deal with it. Uh, he can't take on g4. He doesn't have time, so he chooses to uh, play queen g3. Now, uh, that's kind of interesting. He's got some counterplay on c7, but I'm all that. Am I all that worried about that pawn on c7? No. What I'm worried about is getting this bishop on f8 out. That's my, more my priority. Uh, I have to stop and deal with my bishop right now. Now I could take his bishop, I suppose, and maybe that's. Uh, a natural move that some people would do, but when it's all said and done, uh, uh, the, the same problems that I was just discussing come back. Here, let me just show you, and we'll we'll see. Knight takes g3, queen takes g3. Now I've got to deal with the bishop, right? Okay. If I put it on h5, well, I don't know. Maybe he'll do a maneuver. Knight uh, knight e2. Well, f4 or or get it to g3 somehow, move the queen, find a new square for the queen, and start chasing that bishop. Plus, putting it on h5 takes me off, uh, takes me off uh, this this diagonal that I want to play e6 in. So h5 is no good, and, and if I put it on f5, then that same problem comes back, pawn to h5. So I don't really want to take this bishop. I'd much rather just give him this pawn on c7 and try and and get my pieces out of the box on the king side. Okay, so uh, let me find the place on the PGN. So bishop f5. Okay, so I, I bring it back, and now he goes ahead and takes the pawn on c7. So let's just do a quick stock. What he's done is now he's regained the pawn he's gambited, right? I have six pawns, he has six pawns. But it's my move, and, and I can start working on, on getting developed. And because he's taken that pawn on c7, one interesting thing about about this capture, and something to think about, just a general rule, we know it's said that a pawn is worth three tempos. So in other words, if you sacrifice a pawn and get three pieces out, uh, it's worth it. Plus, you're the, you're, you're the aggressor. Okay? Now, it's taken white one move to take that pawn, and it's going to take him another move put that bishop in place somewhere else. And where does where is that somewhere else? Well, uh, most of the long diagonal is covered. It could go back to g3, and then I might just take it off, uh, if, if I can, and hop my other knight into f4. Uh, well, I can't do that, but, I, but I, I, have a, I have a knight f4 maneuver here in mind. But also, because that c pawn is, is uh, missing now, I've got some tactics on the c file with my queen, and you're, gonna, you're going to see him with my next move. And, and there it is. Now, why that knight? Well, I don't want to put the other knight there, because it just renews the threat of h5 and possibilities. And even though f4 hangs, c4 hangs as a result. So uh, what he does is he goes... Uh, and if he doesn't take on f4, his bishop's hanging on on d on c7. So what kind of moves can White try here? Uh, he could try pawn pawn d6. Let's think think about that for a moment. Uh, it protects his bishop on c7. It uh, if I if I meekly push e6. Oops, d7 check. But I believe I can. I, I think I'm fine out of this if he plays d6. I don't remember all my analysis is in another notebook somewhere. Uh, e5 is certainly a possibility, and uh, I think I can wiggle my way out of this. But it's 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 interesting, and there's there's definitely a lot of possibilities, and and this just reinforced my my two knights over here, and now I'm getting ready to play bishop, uh, uh, or sorry, g6 followed by bishop g7. E5 is a little bit of a problem, but I can I can cover that okay, but. It, 
uh, maybe D6. He didn't play D6, and this is a correspondence game against a strong player. I'm sure he considered it as a candidate move, and spending all this hours of analysis trying to show you whether that's good or bad, that's something for you guys learning this opening to do, to develop opening theory. Uh, I'll, just get you, I'll just lay out the road map and, and, and let you guys take it from here. So, I mean, there's definitely some, some uh, really uh, interesting possibilities in this opening. Okay, so let's see. Let me find the place on this PGN. So I played knight gf4, and then he goes ahead and takes on on f4. But this gives me exactly what I want to free to help free myself. Uh, so you know maybe d6 was better. I don't remember my analysis, but this just gives me a chance to take his bishop on on uh, c4, and now e6 is is much easier to play if I need to play it so I can finish getting my king side developed. Okay, so now uh, let's take a quick stock. I'm threatening a bishop on f4. We both have two minor pieces and a queen out. The only difference is uh, white is castled, so uh, and uh, the white king side pawn structure is a little, a little uh, shaky. So it's safe to say black has equalized this position. He's, he's got a fighting chance uh, to win if, if he reaches an ending. Especially ha having the bishop pair. Okay, so he goes back to c7. He found that I, I guess that was a useful square. <laughs> Maybe he didn't like the other ones, but that's what he played. Uh, theoretically, uh, I could chase it again with rook c8, but I, I didn't play that move because why? I need to get developed, <laughs> and I don't remember my analysis to rook c8. It, it might be an interesting move, but g6, and now finally there's a glimmer of hope here that that pieces are going to get out. So uh, White continues with his development. You know he's not finished either. And hooray! I'm getting ready to castle. The problem with the dark squared bishop is solved, and we have a game. And here he chose to now play bishop e5, and I just continue developing. I castled, and and he took it. This uh, takes away a lot of the dark squared defense on my king side, and. Uh, but again, that's all right. Uh, let's take a quick stock. What's going on? Material's even. Uh, development is even. Both sides have two minor pieces developed and a queen. Both sides are castled. Uh, both uh, development is exactly even. The, the difference is uh, black has a bishop for a knight, and white has some weak kingside pawns. Although it's conceivable that those kingside pawns could start disappearing here. Maybe white's going to be able to play h5 not only with some attacking chances, but he, he can he'll get that pawn traded off, and then he's only got uh, uh, a weak pawn on f3, and I've got a, a potential pawn majority against it, and uh, with my other two. Uh, G pawn and F pawn. He does have a queen side pawn majority from the C file over to the A file, and the if I lose my E7 pawn, uh, well, not only would it be a pawn down, but he'd have a pass pawn on D6, but he'd have a four on two majority. So uh, e, E7 of mine is a little shaky, but not too worried about that right now. At least I'm developed, and and there's chances now to find moves. And White doesn't have like like I say, that proverbial advantage or a demonstration of a of a win, and uh, if White continues with moves like Knight G3 to try to put some pressure, well, White uh, Black can give a check with the Queen, which uh, pins the Knight and brings the Queen over to help defend on the Queen side. Uh, you know, we'll happily trade Queens if we think we're getting attacked and allow uh, White to take the Bishop on F5 to improve the position of the Knight and go into an ending. Now, Black's okay here. Not winning, but he's okay. Okay, so now he finds rook d4. Uh, gain, develop the rook and gain uh, some time, and I back it up. And now he swings this knight into play, uh, improving its position and, and with another tempo. And uh, here I, I play the double-edged uh, queen a5. This puts a, th uh, puts a threat on a2. Okay, so he... Even though he's shifting his a his attention over the king side, I I'm stopping just to remind him that I might be attacking him too. Okay, and he goes knight to from two to c three, 
and now I felt this was the moment to just stop the potential of that uh, pawn advance. Stop it right now. Yeah, I could play h5, but but uh, I think the knight's a little better for black on on h5 than on uh, g7. Okay, so uh, he continues with queen e queen e5. Now it looks like white's got a terrific game, and and if you're white here, you you certainly have to be happy. But I'm happy with my game too. Uh, I just have to watch out for for some tricks. I got to make sure that that uh, a rook doesn't go to g1, and I drop uh, my bit my f5 bishop to a because of the pin. Um, uh, my queen side attack is really not there. It I'll, I need to if I want to do something, I need to put a rook on c8 or b8 and it start advancing my b pawn. So the white white attacks a little a little farther ahead than blacks, but really black can be happy here. Uh, white doesn't really have uh, a noticeable uh, or forcing win. Black has black continues to have resources here, and at this point, I decided it was just time to go ahead and liquidate this knight and get it get it off the board. My bishop has served its purpose. It uh, it uh, it's time for it, for it to come off the board. And he has several ways to retake, and and he took with the f pawn. I'm not going to analyze all the other choices. And then e7 is hanging, but I but I let it hang. I didn't uh, I didn't take it. I mean I didn't stop and guard it. I played rook rook a c8 here. I just let him have it if he wants it. And again, this is a correspondence game. Uh, and oh, th this gentleman lives in Czechoslovakia, so. Uh, well, it's the Czech Republic today, Prague, but but uh, moves to, to to this opponent can take a long time. And this was played when the Iron Curtain was still up, uh, before the uh, Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union dissolved, and but still it was taking a long time for uh, for moves. Just looking at the score sheet, uh, we started a game in December of 1986, and at this point in time. Uh, let's see, I've just played my 24th move. The game is well over a year old. <laughs> so some people say, that's that takes forever. I can play an online game in a, in a week or a couple of days. Well, yeah, you can, but did you really study the game? Uh, and this was the pace I was comfortable playing with. I had a lot of games going on, and I could sit and analyze these things for the two or three weeks in between moves and just take more notes, and I was happy. So... To try to show you all the notes would be fruitless. I won't, obviously. and I, I don't even have them handy, but I wouldn't if I did. But he chooses here to come come back and redeploy the rook. Uh, he figures it's time. If he's going to do anything here, he needs to attack uh, to attack my king. And uh, he he basically has one weakness in this position. That's the pawn on h4. One, one thing about my uh, bishop takes e4 maneuver was it it got rid of his weakness on f3, but the e4 pawn is still kind of weak, so black's looking for two weaknesses but in order to win this, but the, we're not in the ending. We're a long way from the ending with the queens on the board, and and uh, although both sides have a potential to attack on the king side, uh, neither one has really tried it yet, and until now, uh, to attack the king. And finally, I play the thematic move that I want to play. I, I go ahead and... Uh, and do this, and again, I'm not concerned about the pawn on e7. Uh, maybe, maybe I have an, a sack on c3 uh, with all kinds of play, and then the knight uh, on uh, h5 can get thrown into the game through g3 with tempo, uh, and then counterplay other other possibilities. It's just crazy uh, wh wh what can happen. No need to get into all that. Okay, so he continues with. Uh, with his with his plan of taking on h5, so it, it's kind of like put up or shut up right now. And what's white? Uh, how's black going to continue this? And I calculated that I can actually get away with uh, with pawn b4 here. I, I will allow him to take on h5 because then I will take on c3, and suddenly I have uh, my own attacking potential. And he doesn't really yet. He still has to. Uh, his king side king position is getting shattered a little quicker than mine will, because he still doesn't have the h file open yet. 
he's going to have to go through a slow maneuver, queen h6, then followed by h5, and it's still not uh, clear exactly how he's going to get through, and I've got a couple moves to do some things too. So, at this point, he uh, just plays plays it safe and plays knight e2, and now, this is this is an interesting point of the game. Um, it's also the final point of the game, and I sent him what we call, you know, conditional moves or if moves uh, to try to speed up the game. And unless I continued this game on another score sheet, which I sometimes would do, uh, just the arrangement of I used a thing called the postal log, and you have stick em pieces on plastic boards with loosely in a loose leaf binder that zips up, zips up. Really nifty thing, really nifty invention. Before, of course, we have all our games on databases and and so forth and and saved here on sites like chess.com you just carry it anywhere and open it up and look at it and that's what I did I took it to work and if I didn't have anything to do I'd open it up and and I'd keep a little pocket set in there too and I'd analyze positions <laughs> I was doing chess all the time 24 7 it seemed like uh, because I you know I wanted to play masters and here I was I was playing them like left and right uh, and anyway like I say I sent a long conditional streak, and, and apparently the game's going to end here, and I'll explain in a moment why. Unless, sometimes, like I say, I would, I'd finish the games and rearrange the, the, the postal log, and then continue the score sheet later, and hopefully remember to uh, get all the moves somewhere. Well, I remember this game. I remember the, how I got out of uh, the development trouble I had with the with the Fianchetto, but I, at, from, from the next few moves, I don't really remember much more of the game if it even took place. And you'll see why in a moment. Oh, don't do this to me. <laughs> it was tr trying to break down. Did you see that? <laughs> okay. So I took on A2 and I sent a, a, a conditional string. And it continues. If here, then check. It's doing it again. Don't do that. Conditional string check. And King D2. If King D2, then here. And what happened, uh, but like I say, my score sheet ends here. If I went, if this game lasts another 20 moves, I really don't remember. And I, I didn't find another uh, score sheet to this. So my feeling is that White resigned right here. Because I know I won the game. That's that's a definite. I did win the game. But I'm thinking that White resigned here. And actually, Black is a little bit better off. And he's got some candidate moves here. Uh, Rook C1, and that just allows B3. Uh, and uh, or he could play his queen back to f3 and try and get his queen to help out but then I just take on c2 with check uh, and then I've got these potentially monster pawns on the queen side well he has an extra knight but I want to ex explain something about uh, uh, master class postal chess it doesn't seem to happen a lot on chess.com masters will give up games that you don't Believe. Well, why are they resigning? Well, the fact is, it's it, it's kind of a respect thing that they know the player is strong enough to see what's going on. I mean, they'll resign them even quicker than they do over the board. Uh, grandmasters do over the board simply because uh, the outcome is inevitable. Uh, and I I can't tell you why my opponent resigned, or maybe he had too many games, felt this was bad, he didn't want to defend it. Uh, but he chose to give up, and it's and you know I'm seeing players play on. Right. People are telling me they're up two rooks, a queen, a pawn, and about to queen two more pawns, and their opponent's still playing. And, you know, it, it's your right. We're, we're not going to criticize you. We're just going to beat you, you know. I mean, anything can happen. We can die. You win. Uh, we lose Internet service for a week. You win on time. Anything can happen. But it, I'm telling you, at the higher level master class, uh, often players will just resign a, a, a game they don't want to defend. And anyway... That's what happened here. I'm pretty sure he gave up here. I looked through all my score sheets. I didn't find a continued one. I found a lot of others that are continued. I need to get these loaded to a database for see sorting. I have to rely on my memory. And I knew this game and this opponent had this variation that I wanted to show. I got that much down. And they, uh, I'll get another news of itch video out to you real quick. I want to thank you for taking time to look at look at this. Have fun looking at the variations on your own. Hopefully you're learning a little bit more about it. And these are exciting times as we uh, conquer the world with an Imzovich defense. Aaron would be proud of all of you for taking this up. Thanks for your time. Take care.